Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, dear viewers, to a live program of Gems of the Heart. I'm your host for the evening, Junaid Da. Dear viewers, we've been off air for a number of weeks, I think prior to Ramadan, about six, seven weeks. But now we are back and we are live. And inshallah ta'ala, we are going to be continuing our program every Wednesdays here at 6 p.m. That's Cairo time, 4 p.m. Uh, GMT. So do join us live on our special program of Gems of the Heart. Dear viewers, as you are aware, Gems of the Heart is a very unique program where we are looking at the affairs of Al-Islam, especially those that are pertaining to the belief in Allah, those that are pertaining to Iman, the faith in the unseen, as well as other aspects of the deen. But more importantly, as the title suggests, what is the link between all of these articles of faith and our heart? How do we increase our Iman? How do we increase ourselves as believers and close to Allah by the belief in these various aspects? As you are aware, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us that there is an organ inside the body. If this organ is sound, it's good, it's righteous, then the rest of the body would also be righteous and sound. If this organ is corrupt, it's diseased, it has problems, then the rest of the body would also have problems. And that organ is none other than the heart. So inshallah ta'ala, our aim for this program is to rectify our hearts, to purify our hearts, and to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dear viewers, there are a number of different things that this program has discussed so far. We've had a look at the issues of aqidah in belief in general. In our previous program, we also looked at tawheed, where we looked at the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we began with, <coughs> sorry, we began with the very beginning, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Lord, as the creator. And today, inshallah, we're going to be looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his worship. We worship Allah alone and not associate any partners with him. Him. Also, as we get closer towards the end of the program, we will be bringing back the question of the week as we do every single time. So do stay tuned for that and do engage uh, with us on that particular aspect. Our lines are open, so do call us, give us your questions, your comments, your queries. You can see the numbers there running across your screen, so please do get involved. Let me begin by introducing our Sheikh, and then we can go straight into the discussion for today. If I can begin by introducing Sheikh Ibrahim Zidan, mashallah, uh, working very hard with us here on Huda TV. Sheikh, I'd like to begin by saying assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Sheikh, uh, alhamdulillah, we started our discussion of Tawheed and linking it to the affairs of the heart. And in our last program, we talked about uh, Tawheed Rububiyyah, talking about the Lordship of Allah. And today we want to look at the second aspect of Tawheed, which is Tawheed al Ibadah, the worship. Um, can I ask. If we can begin by defining what is Tawheed al-Uluhiyya or Tawheed al-Ibadah? Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Tawheed as we know means oneness, comes from wahid. So Tawheed al-Ibadah or Tawheed al-Uluhiyya is the oneness of worship. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one to be worshipped. Subhanahu wa ta'ala with the comprehensive meaning of what al-Ibadah means. And this is the Tawheed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the messengers with. To call people to worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And that's what human beings, they need the messengers for. The first type of tawheed, which is the tawheed of al-rububiyyah, the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most human beings, they believe in this, that Allah is the creator, the sustainer, and so on. But they needed the messengers of Allah to call them to worship the one that they believe that he's the Lord and the creator, the sustainer. And that's the only way for the heart to be sound and to be purified and to take away from the hearts anything that is being worshipped or attached or so other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship to worship none but Him in every single aspect of worship to be only done for, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, um, uh, Shaykh also, uh, many may be wondering at this point that uh, after what you've explained, what's the connection then with ibadah, the oneness in, in worship and the heart? How are these two things connected? No. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran Whoever believes in Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide his heart And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that people in the day of judgment They will be disgraced As okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Ibrahim alayhi salam Wala tukhzini yawma yub'athun Yawma la yamfa'u malu wa la banun Illa man ata allaha biqalbin salim right. Do not disgrace me in the day of judgment And the day when there is no wealth nor offsprings Will benefit the person Except those who come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala With a sound heart so the heart is the origin with all things starts from it. Belief starts from the heart, action, speech, and everything. So if a person do righteous good deeds, 
but without the tawheed and the oneness of worship in the heart these deeds are not righteous okay even if they look and they sound like righteous deeds hypocrites they did good things but it's not considered it's not called good okay. it's called evil why because the heart is evil and the worst evil is when the heart is attached to other than Allah when a person seek the pleasure of other than Allah there's nothing more evil than this this is filth in the heart so, so to purify the heart with the worship of Allah. So Shaykh, what we're saying is that Tawheed is directly linked with the purification of one's heart. Right. This is the real purification of the heart. Without it, the hearts are contaminated forever unless a person purified with the Tawheed of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, excellent. Uh, Shaykh, that naturally brings us on to the next question. Um, we began by talking about uh, Rububiya and now we're talking about Ibadah. Um, some may ask, where did these categorizations come from and who invented them or were they there before? What's the history behind that? Now, uh, the ulama, when they looked into the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, and you would see that this is the way of the Quran. Uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling the human beings to do, what is the belief and worship and so on. So the categorizing things is to make it easy for people to remember. Okay. But it's not something that is an invention. It's just basically like you say, there's the knowledge of tafsir, the knowledge of hadith, the knowledge of fiqh. It's to make it easy for people to learn the aspects of the religion. So the same thing when we say we believe in Allah. What does that mean? To believe in Allah, which is the first pillar of Al-Iman. Okay. Then we have to explain it in a comprehensive way. How is the Qur'an addressing this first pillar of Al-Iman? You would find in the Qur'an verses that talks about the rububiyyah of Allah. That Allah is Ar-Rabb. It's mentioned in the Qur'an that He's Ar-Rabb. He's the Lord. He's the owner. He's the creator and so on. So this is, He's the only creator. He's the only sustainer. So this is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. And then we find in the Qur'an the messengers of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calling people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Otherwise a person is a disbeliever and he's in the hellfire forever. Okay. So there is oneness of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. And also there is the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all over the Quran. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in them. And nothing is the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These three things you would find them in the Quran talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing else. Okay. So that's why where this is by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person can look at the Quran in a comprehensive way. When we talk about the first pillar of Al-Iman, we need to have these three aspects secured in our hearts to purify ourselves by worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and the other aspects of Tawheed. Okay, Subhanallah and Shaykh, you made mention of the names and attributes uh, of Allah and that's going to be an upcoming program. It's going to be a fantastic program when we look at the names of Allah, it really uh, connects you with, with your Lord. And it's, it, this is how the purification is completed and perfected when it comes with the names of Allah and getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and introducing that to the heart. And then the speech and actions will fall in place if the heart is sound and correct. Okay, excellent. Uh, Shaykh, I want to have a look at some of the evidences, some of the verses inside the Quran where Allah commands the issue of, uh, of ibadah, worship only for Allah. And one of the verses that comes to mind which contains both uh, Tawheed and Shirk in the same verse uh, is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa wa bihi shay'a. Can I ask you to just talk about this verse, please? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa wa la bihi shay'a. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not associate partners with Him. Uh, and you see how perfectly it's mentioned that it is not sufficient to say, Wa Worship Allah subhanahu okay. wa ta'ala. Unless you, it become perfected by saying, And do not associate partners with Him. Because the mushrikeen, the polytheists, sometimes they would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Okay. And it did not make them believers. When their time of need or in the middle of the ocean or whatever distress is falling upon them, they would call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Did not make them believers. Till their, their entire life is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and running away and away from associating partners with Allah. So that's why when we talk about the tawheed and the oneness of worship of Allah in the heart and our speech and actions, it is not sufficient to just say the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless we know what negates it, what breaks okay. it. Exactly the same that if a person knows how to make wudu, but it doesn't know that how, what things breaks the wudu. That person makes make, might make wudu, breaks his wudu during the salah, he doesn't know it. Okay. So he, salah is not valid. So the same thing, a person knowing the tawheed, it is not sufficient till a person knows what negates it from the shirk and associating partners with Allah. So and the same meaning is mentioned a lot in the Quran. So in order to affirm one's tawheed, there must be an element of negation at the same time. Right. And that's how the deen of Islam is always like this. Things for us to do, things to stay away from. Okay. And it doesn't just happen by default like this because shaitan is working 
for people to fall into shirk and associating partners with Allah. So unless we do an action to push this away from us, then a person can easily fall into matters of shirk. Okay, excellent. Then, Shaykh, I'd also like to tie in here the very famous verse, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Does that also fall into the aspect of Tawheed al-Ibadah? Naam, definitely, because that's what the verse is so exclusively mentioned, that the only reason why we're created is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Negation in the beginning of the verse, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ Negating that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me. That's the highest level of exclusiveness in a statement. So this is the only purpose of our life, and that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we look at the worship, we have salah, we have dua, we have sacrifice, we have all kinds of things. Any ibadah of this, whether it's done by the heart or the speech or the actions, has to be only for the sake of Allah. Otherwise, if a person makes sujood to an idol, that takes the person outside the fold of an Islam. Why? Because sujood is ibadah. So the same thing with the tawakkul, relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear of Allah, hoping for the rewards from Allah. So every single order in the Quran and okay. in the Sunnah of the Prophet <coughs> has to be only for the sake of Allah. Okay, excellent, Shaykh. We'll take one more verse from the, from the Quran which is pertaining to the subject. And that's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ بَأَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنَا إِبُدُ اللَّهُ وَجْتَنِبُ التَّاغُوتِ Naam. What does that mean? There are a few verses like this in the Quran that explains La ilaha illallah. And that's the beauty of the Quran that we know that the first pillar of Islam is to say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. La ilaha illallah means there's no one worthy of worship except Allah. You would find the meaning is mentioned in many verses in the Quran, one of which is this one. That وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ رسول. We have sent in every nation a messenger to do what? To call people to what? To two things. And يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجِتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Worship okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and stay away from al taghut This is لا إله إلا الله. لا إله no one, no deity, no one is to be worshipped. That's the taghut Anything that has been worshipped, anything that has been followed, anything that has been obeyed other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that becomes taghut that we're ordered to stay away from it and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So this is what every messenger of Allah he came to the people and it's amazing when you reflect upon how the messengers and their people if the messengers of Allah they would just call the people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone there might not be dispute too much between them and their people but the dispute happened when when, when they told them uh, the negation negation okay stay away from these idols that you are worshipping stay away from these things that you're worshipping besides Allah this is where the disputes and the war and the bloodshed and all of this because of which that's why they both uh, they're never to be separated whatsoever. So it's not like we have some concepts flying around that uh, we can accept everybody's faith. Mm -hmm. You accept me, I accept you, but as a Muslim and a, as a believer in Tawheed, it's impossible to do so. Right, and that's why if we talk to uh, anyone, say a Jew or a Christian or anyone, if you say worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everybody would say, sure, Everyone's no problem. Happy. Right, <laughs> but when we say worshiping Jesus, the son of Mary, takes the person outside the truth, and if you continue to do that, he will be the hellfire forever, you would find situations here right right there, ha there has to be a line drawn that that's why the the religion of islam is to call people to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worship him alone and to stay away from all of these idols all of these images even if it's a prophet of allah if he's if he's being worshipped besides allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that negation has to be there okay excellent uh, we'll have a look at some of the evidences from the sunnah as well but just before we do that uh, dear viewers, I'd like to give you a gentle reminder of two things. First and foremost is our numbers, and they are running across the screen. So please do call us, give us your questions, your comments. What issues do you have with regards to Tawheed? What needs explaining? The issues of Shirk, are you confused about anything? Do you have any questions? Call us here live in the studio, inshallah ta'ala, the Shaykh will be here ready to answer your questions. At the same time, if you can't get to a telephone, then go onto Facebook and go onto our Facebook page, which is Gems of the Heart, and you will see a post there where you can leave your comments and your questions. And inshallah ta'ala, I will read them out live here in the studio. Uh, okay, Shaykh, let's have a look at some of the evidences uh, from the Sunnah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the stories that comes to mind is, is when uh, uh, Mu'adh bin Jabal was sent to Yemen. Mm -hmm. And what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi ordered him to, to worship Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala alone? Can I ask you to talk about that particular incident? Right. The Prophet Sallallahu he sent Mu'adh radiallahu anhu to Al-Yemen. And he said to him, Innaka ta'ati qawma ahli kitab that you are going to people that are the people of the book, or mainly Jews. And he said to him that make the first thing that you call them to, that they would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Do not associate partners with him. If they obeyed you in this, and they would agree to this, and that's the first pillar of Islam, then inform them 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them to worship and to make salah five times a day. They agreed to this, that informed them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them to give zakah from the rich to the poor and then the fasting. So the pillars of Islam are mentioned after that. So the first thing that the Prophet وسلم, called Mu'ath to call the people to not uh, have good manners or or uh, be good to one another. And so this is part of the deen of Islam. But what's the first thing you call them to? To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to not associate partners with him. Okay. That's by itself an evidence that they were not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. They were on a different way invented religion that it's not the religion of Musa alayhi salam, it's not the religion of Isa alayhi salam. They deviated away from that truth. Okay. Okay, and Sheikh, at the same time, we really stress the importance of, of Tawheed and given a lot of evidences as well. Uh, but in, in a quick summary, what is the reward of a person who perfects his Tawheed, who meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, as, as one who didn't associate any partners with, it, uh, with Allah? Uh, the reward sh- uh, comes from the importance of it. When we see that if a person dies with shirk, this is the unforgivable sin whatsoever. Any other than shirk can be forgiven if a person dies with it, except shirk. Associating partners with Allah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly mentioned in the Quran. Inna Allah la yaghfiru wa yushrika bi. Wa yaghfiru maduna thalika ni ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive that people associate partners with him, and he forgives anything less than that. Mm-hmm. So uh, that by itself, when a person knows this, then you would see that the most important thing, the most rewardable thing, is the tawheed. Because everlasting uh, a board of a person to be in the hellfire, what is worse punishment than this? And the opposite, the best reward is when a person is not in the hellfire forever, and that is to be on the tawheed. But the tawheed, a person might fall into sins. So to complete it and to perfect it is to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to do the, uh, the duties and so on, but to always repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That perfects one's tawheed and it's part of the tawheed so that the tawheed is not weakened. Okay. And that's why when we see the ways of the prophets of Allah and the effect of that in the heart, You know, the heart, if a person even wants to be happy and content, uh, people, why they go to intoxications and they want to waste their life? Because they cannot face the reality of this life the way they live it. Right. But for those who are on the tawheed, everything makes perfect sense. They have contentment. They see the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They understand the purpose of their life. So they would have the real joy of this life and the real contentment in this life. And that's what we're talking about, even rewards in this life. For a person to have a goodly life and to have the heart purified and for the person to protect himself from the punishment in the hereafter. Okay, excellent. Uh, Sheikh, uh, one may consider or, or think that uh, the issue of Tawheed the, in, in the details that we're discussing are particular uh, are containing to the message of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But did every prophet starting from Adam Alayhi Salaam to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have the same message of Tawheed? Yes, and the message never been changed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he sent one messenger to the other with one message and one message only when it comes to matters of belief. And that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and do not associate partners with him as we heard in the previous verse. And we would see that how in every messenger of Allah when he was sent as it's mentioned in the Quran, they called the people to la ilaha illallah. And Isa alayhi salam in the day of judgment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him, did you call the people to worship yourself? And he would say, subhanak, glory be to you, O Allah that I never called them to anything but to worship you alone. Mm-hmm. So this is something that all the messengers of Allah, that w- the, the thing that was different from one messenger to the other is when it comes to ahkam, rulings. Okay. And that changes from one generation to the other till the final message came to the Prophet Wasallam, the universal uh, ruling and everything comprehensive way of life, religion of Islam that was sent to the Prophet Wasallam. Mm-hmm. As far as aqidah, they all came with the same belief. And that's why we see the aqidah is simple. Uh, very simple matters like the six pillars of al-iman and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Okay, excellent. Uh, Sheikh, a very uh, basic question, but uh, one that must be clarified. The issue of tawheed, especially in the ibadah, is it something which is obligatory on every Muslim to do? Uh, this is the most important obligation that every Muslim and every human being should do. Otherwise, there's no value to anything that comes after that. That's why among Muslims, uh, is it can it happen that a Muslim would commit shirk and negates tawheed from himself? Yes, it valita it happens because of ignorance, because of whatever deviation, and that's why uh, one the first duty on a Muslim not to say I say la ilaha illallah I'm good. No, the first duty to all of us we need to perfect our tawheed in matters of belief because there are deviant sects and deviant ways, and we're living in a world of fitan, okay. and many people claim to be Muslims. Right, the name and the claim is the easiest thing. 
But when you look into their beliefs, that some of their beliefs is totally outside the fold of Islam. So it becomes an obligation every Muslim to learn their, their matters of belief and how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to do the deeds accordingly. Okay. And that's also some of the calls that you would find out there. People being called to be kind and to be good and to even do the salah and so on. All of this is beautiful. But where is the aqidah in this aspect? Without the aqidah, without the tawheed, there's no value of all of this. And Shaykh, am I right to break it down into very simple language and to say that uh, our iman and our hearts uh, is not just a matter of statement, but there is action involved. And this is tawheed al-ibadah. Naam. Actions by the heart and actions by the body. So that's why when we're talking about the hearts too, you know, when we say that we, we rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, this is an act of ibad. Who's the one that deserves for us to rely on him alone? Tawakkul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. If a person rely on other than Allah, okay. that other than Allah can forgive him, other than Allah can uh, make his future better or whatever, this is shirk. This is, this is, it makes the heart filthy, does not purify the heart. Just in one aspect, one deed. Many people, they don't consider these are actions. They think okay. only the physical actions. No, there is the love of Allah in the heart. This is an action. The fear of Allah, this is an action. The hope for the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these are actions done by the heart as a result of the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, excellent. So as a Muslim, in order for a, a person to really perfect his tawheed, he must be concerned not just of his speech, but also of his actions so that the, it is purely for the sake of Allah. Right, and to watch, it's not just major things, but minor things. You know, some of the things that might sound very simple, but it shows that this tawheed can be negated somehow, even for in a minor way. You know that sometimes people would send emails or send letters or whatever that I saw this dream or this uh, man in Medina saw this dream and if you don't spread this email or if you don't spread this chain letters, you know, somebody didn't do that and he died and some people did it and they were so prosperous. So what happens when you receive some of these emails if the tawheed is not clear and sound in the heart? You get scared. Okay. You fear that if I don't spread this, I might die, I might lose. This is by itself negating the perfect tawheed. Not relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why these things, Allah. people sent it. And many Muslims, they would do it out of their good intentions. This is a form of shirk that makes the heart attached to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That these things would bring benefit or push away harm. Where is that in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is the one that brings benefit and pushes away harm. So it can come to that level of details. That we have to learn how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Talisman. Uh, things that people wear th on their arms, their necks, uh, going to graveyards and s thinking there's some blessings in that place or that place. All of these are not just simple sins, something that can negate the tawheed and the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It brings up miseries in the heart because it's, the hearts are not done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Mashallah Shaykh, you gave a, a quick summary of uh, all of the aspects of shirk, inshallah ta'ala. We're going to discuss after the break, but yeah, it's a, it's a good summary. And inshallah, when we come back from the break, we can go into its details. Um, on that note, we can take a short rest and uh, we can continue afterwards. Uh, dear viewers, let's take a very short break here. And then when we come back, we'll look at some of the details as the Shaykh uh, made mention of. We'll look at shirk and its details. We'll look at ibadah and what does it mean and how we can purify our ibadah. And don't forget also to join us live in the studio, call us. Give us your comments, give us your questions, whatever you want to bring, inshallah ta'ala, bring it forward. Also join us on our Facebook, give us your comments, inshallah we will read them out live here in the studio as well. Let's take a very short break and then when we come back we'll continue with part two. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, dear viewers, after a very short break here. Joining us on our fantastic live program, Gems of the Heart. Dear viewers, our topic for today is Tawheed al Ibadah. How we can purify our Tawheed, make it purely for the sake of Allah in terms of worship, and how these acts are connected uh, with our heart. If we can come back to our discussion, Sheikh, um, we now moving forward and looking at the issues of ibadah. Can I ask you to be a little bit more specific and tell us what is the meaning of ibadah? Uh, the ibadah is basically anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us in the Quran or in the sunnah of the Prophet sallam, for us to do. Okay. Or if you, when some of the ulama, they give a definition to it, a very comprehensive definition, as they say, ismun jama'a Very comprehensive word that everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and pleased with, whether it's done physically, outwardly, or inwardly, okay. whether it's speech or action. So uh, then our job is to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and pleased with. And that's to get to know that from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Any order, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do, that's, that means it's ibadah. That's how it has to be only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. And not just one act or salah only or dhikr only. It's everything in our heart and there are ibadat done by the heart, ibadat done with the tongue and with physical actions, all of which are basically constitutes the ibadah. So just to make it uh, into simple language so uh, everyone can understand, uh, the issues of ibadah obviously like mentioned in the Quran, like the salah, the zakat uh, and, and the fasting, this is all acts of worship. But for example, if I'm leaving my house and, uh, and I'm leaving my house to go to work so I can provide for my family, if my intention is to please Allah, is that an act of worship as well? Definitely, because that's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. And uh, uh, providing for the family, and this is a form of charity. So it all comes into the heart. Some of these physical things that all human beings do, the difference between the believers and the disbelievers in this is that the believers, their hearts are working because they're having the proper intention. Okay. And also they would abstain from haram. You okay. know, something forbidden for them in their workplace or so. They would lower their gaze. They would not deal with haram money. So all of this, by not doing even things, but staying away from haram, this is by itself, is a rewardable act. And that comes part of the ibadah and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although, you know, the, 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 the transactions and the worldly things, of course, is different than the worship, which is rituals. Because the rituals are the ones that when it comes to ibadah, nobody can invent any ibadah. Okay. It has to be only from the Quran, the Sunnah, the Prophet Sallam, and that's why it's the original words of ibadah comes to it. Okay, subhanAllah. So really, when, if you, as a Muslim, when you think about the act of ibadah, it's every single thing in your life. Right. If you just have the intention to please Allah, even walking, sleeping, eating, it could be ibadah. Right. And that's why with the intention and following the way of the Prophet Sallam. That's why our life is to know the Prophet Sallam and what did he say, how did he act, and so on, with the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Okay, excellent. Sheikh, the issues of ibadah, as some of uh, our, our scholars define it, it is built upon certain pillars. And some of the scholars say there are three, and some say there are more. Uh, from amongst those pillars, could I ask you to talk about the very first one, uh, which is al-hub, which is love. How is that connected with our hearts and with tawheed? Uh, when, when, when people look into the actions of all human beings, nobody do anything unless it's based on love. You can see all the actions of human beings based on love. Love of money, love of wealth, love of desires, whatever there is, any movement in this life, people do it because of the love of something. The love of life, so they would save themselves from trouble. Anything they do is because of this. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. For the believers, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from them. Every move in their life should be because of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. And this is the perfect love. So their actions will be because of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he's the one that created love it itself. And they witness the mercy and the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what the heart is always. This is something that doesn't leave the heart. And that's the effect of the worship, ibadah. That we say the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ibadah is based on whether it's in some one aspect, two pillars. The perfect love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the perfect submission to Allah mm -hmm. subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that never leaves the heart whatsoever at all times. Work, school, house, masjid, whatever there is. SubhanAllah. And we can find that also, Shaykh, uh, when we look at the verses uh, inside of the Quran, when Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدَّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And no. those who believe, they are severe in their love for Allah. Right. And this is, the, the ayah was mentioned about those who take partners without Allah subhanahu, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they love them besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَا يَتَّخِذُوا أَنْدَادًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ They take partners and they love them the way they love Allah. So in the verse, it said that they, these mushrikeen, these polytheists, they love Allah. Okay. But they love the partners that they worship besides Allah the way they love Allah. SubhanAllah. And it did not benefit them that they loved Allah. The love of Allah has to be pure and sincere. In that level that no one is to be loved, that perfect love, the love of ibadah. The love of worship, it's only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what the essence of the ibadah is. Okay, excellent. So that's the first pillar that some scholars say that uh, the Tawheed of Ibadah is built upon. The second thing they mention, Shaykh, is the fact of in Arabic, Ar-Raja, which is to hope and to have hope in something. How is that connected with Tawheed? Um, Ar-Raja is to hope for the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and the worship of Allah meaning to do things and to stay away from things and the rewards are mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and these are the people that they seek in the pleasure of Allah so they hope for the rewards from Allah that Allah is pleased, would be pleased with them they would enter the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is an act of worship and this is part of the ibadah because otherwise a person would have bad expectations of Allah which negates the fact that they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful and the, the most forgiver and so on so al-raja comes with actions okay so when people do the act of worship and they hope for the rewards from Allah right. not that it's wishful thinking that has nothing to do with actions not to wish or to say I know or I hope that Allah reward me but then I don't do anything about it no to be truthful and to fulfill the orders of Allah while hoping for the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone okay excellent and that reminds of the verse when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us yarjuna rahmatahu no. that they hope for his mercy no. And they fear the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why they go together. Subhanallah. Hoping for the rewards from Allah alone, it's like a bird with one wing. Okay. It won't go far. Subhanallah. Uh, and uh, Shaykh, the third pillar that uh, the scholars say that uh, Tawhid al-Ibadah is built upon is that of uh, al-Khawf, which is the fear no. of Allah. Can I ask you to talk about right. that one? And this is the other wing, as Shaykh said to me. Like the love is like, give the example of a bird. The head is the love. Without the head, there's, you know, okay. there's no bird. And the two wings, one is al-raja, the hope for the rewards from Allah, and the other one is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fear of Allah, the fear of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to fear that a person will commit sins and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade us of things. And these things are forbidden for us to do. It's not forbidden just uh, for um, no reason whatsoever, no, for a reason, for the great wisdom, and there's a punishment with it. And part of they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is the most merciful okay. and He is severe in punishment. Okay. And this is the perfect belief that the believers have. Many other human beings, they just want to talk about the rewards of Allah or the hope for the rewards of Allah. But when you read the Quran, when you see the, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, Adam alayhi salam, he came down from Jannah, from paradise because of one sin. SubhanAllah. Shaitan, he was kicked out of the mercy of Allah forever because of not prostrating to Adam alayhi salam after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him. Forever he was kicked out of the mercy of Allah. We see in the Quran that whoever dies in the state of shirk, he's in the hellfire forever. Forever, everlasting, worst punishment ever. You know, some people when they think about this, they say, how can that be? Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just. So he is the most severe in punishment, but at the same time he's the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the right balance. So when a believer he hears that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade something. That's not to be taken as play or, you know, this is, negates the fact that we're slaves of Allah. Right. You know, that it negates actually the perfection of the creator of the heavens and the earth. So when people think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a, as a Lord of mercy and love and, and that's it, that's basically they're not believing in the right way in the creator of the heavens and the earth. Subhanahu they're believing in some weak uh, thing. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most perfect. So when he forbade something, it is serious and that's why people need to stay away from it but at the same time if a person fall into what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid if they repent to him he's the most merciful okay and that's the balance that has to be present in the life of the believers not just hope 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 but hope and fear okay. and we have sometimes we have both at the same time and I think that's the human nature Shaykh, isn't it that right. uh, sometimes you desire something so you work hard for it and sometimes you're afraid of something so you don't do it this is the nature of human beings and every human being hope and fear and if a person does not hope for the rewards of Allah and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will be punished or she will be punished by hoping and fearing other than Allah. Yeah, so it's not like there's no hope and fear. No, every human being, they have fear. Okay. So the believers, they fear none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And both are together sometimes like in salah. We make our prayer, you hope for the rewards of Allah, but you also fear that it might not be accepted. That because of the khushu is not there and so on and so forth. So both are present in any aspect of our life. Okay, Sheikh, mashallah, we're going very systematically today. We've had a definition, uh, we've had some evidences. Uh, we also had a look at some of the, uh, the pillars on which Ibadah is standing upon. And the next thing, if I could ask you to talk about, are uh, the conditions. You mentioned there are two conditions for any act of Ibadah to be accepted by Allah. What are these two conditions? The two conditions are mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, ﷺ, one of which, man kana rabbi Whoever wants to do righteous good deeds, he should 
uh, do righteous deeds and you should not associate partners with Allah. So the first condition is that the deed has to be sincere for the sake of Allah. Fulfilling the meaning of la ilaha illallah, the oneness of worship. That the one that we're worshipping, the one that we're seeking rewards from, the one that we're worshipping with this one particular act of worship is only for the sake of Allah, seeking rewards from Allah in the hereafter. Okay. And following the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Otherwise, a person can invent his own ways of doing things. Now we have to follow. <coughs> and that's the sign of a person being a slave of Allah. Okay. That we have limits. We want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, but our desires to worship Him subhanahu wa ta'ala is according to the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So without these two conditions, the deeds are not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how you see the effect of that in the heart. The heart has this ikhlas. This is a deed done by the heart. Sincerity. Okay. Purely for the sake of Allah. This is not something to be said by the tongue. A person would not say, I make my salah sincerely for the sake of Allah. It doesn't benefit him if he says this. And actually it's innovation to say that anyway. It's what if he is he sincerely in the heart doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone or showing off. And when we say we follow the Prophet sallam, this is the humbleness. Okay. That a person, he knows that he doesn't know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have no means to know what's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except by following the way of the Prophet sallam. So they both come into the heart with the khushu' and the humbleness and to be away from arrogance and to sincerely worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, this is the right servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question here with regards to these two conditions. Um, if I have sincerity in an action and I'm doing it purely for the sake of Allah, but at the same time I want other benefits as well. So is that allowed? So for example, if I'm worshipping, I remember we talked about this in our Ramadan program. Mm. If I am fasting Mondays and Thursdays, I'm doing a voluntary fast, I want to worship Allah, but at the same time I want to lose some weight. Mm. So I mean, what would you say to that? Right. No, the intentions in the heart should be sincerely for the sake of Allah. This is an act of ibadah. So the ibadah here is to be done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And that is seeking rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone in the hereafter. But, and the good things of this life will come with it. Okay. So you don't need to seek that. In the heart, a person has to focus that he's not seeking this. This is the action that is done by the heart. Seeking, we seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Uh, losing weight, healthy life, all of this comes with it because Allah <laughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala never ordered us to do anything unless it's perfect in our lifestyle in this life and the rewards in hereafter. But our hearts attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone seeking the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We, uh, naturally, we want to get as uh, bargains as we can, buy one, get one free. Right, right. So how? <laughs> uh, so also looking at uh, the sunnah, following the sunnah of the Prophet yes. um, is it possible that I follow the sunnah of the Prophet but at the same time, I think there is a better way to do something. And this better way, um, I'm not saying that it's uh, that the sunnah is not good or it's deficient, but I feel that I can get closer to Allah by doing something new. Mm -hmm. Would that be accepted? Uh, definitely not. Because this is a sign of arrogance. And this is what negates Muhammad Rasulullah. What we, when we say Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah, that means he's the messenger of Allah. And what is the meaning of a messenger of Allah? That means we don't know what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to worship him, how to come closer to him. You know, it's only through the messengers of Allah. Otherwise, religions becomes as many as the numbers of people on earth. Okay. And everybody would claim on that they're on the truth. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a messenger. And to be the final messenger to all mankind, all human beings on the earth today, they're ordered to follow the way of the Prophet وسلم, one man. That is the messenger وسلم, And to follow him, that means not to even add anything, not to take anything, to follow. And that's very easy to understand. What is the meaning of following? If you're following someone in a direction or going somewhere, uh, that you don't invent things. Otherwise, you might lose direction and end up being in the, in the worst state. So it's not permissible for anyone to invent anything in matters of religion. Whether it's matters of belief, whether it's acts of worship, we have to ask first, what is the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as the people of knowledge? And once we know that this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did and say and believed and so on, then we believe and say and act by following the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, Sheikh, this alternative route, which is um, contrary to the Sunnah, like you might mention, um, what is the Islamic terminology for that and what's its understanding? No, it's called bid'ah. Okay. Your innovations in the deen. Right. As we said, you know, the La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, that every Muslim says it, and this is the first pillar of Islam, has four things so important for us as Muslims, each Muslim, to know it very well. The Tawheed, the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and what negates that is the shirk associating partners with Allah. To perfect the first part of the kalima, La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah, there's two things that we have to know. 
Okay. Muhammad Rasulullah, that means we need to follow the way of the Prophet Sallallahu What negates this is the bid'ah, is the innovation in the deen. Right. To invent uh, an act of worship, to invent a matter of belief that it's not the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Once a person knows what's to be done and what negates it to us, stay away from it, that, that person perfected the first pillar of Islam and then anything else comes after that is then perfected because the foundation is sound and clear. So al-bid'ah or innovations in the deen is a duty in our life to stay away, to run away from it. And this is where the shaitan works on the ummah. Okay. And works on the people of knowledge also to uh, some of them they might deviate uh, their followers or because it's too difficult to, to be against the people. But we have to be clear that we follow the way of the Prophet Sheikh, so, talking on the issue of bid'ah, because this is a bit of a, uh, a confusing subject at times, um, I want to just make mention of some actions which you see across the world and I want to understand is this from the Sunnah of the Prophet or not? Um, from amongst some of these is people, uh, for example, dancing, jumping up and down, mentioning Allah's name a hundred times and jumping up and, uh, and claiming that they are getting closer to Allah. Is this a Sunnah or is this a bid'ah? Uh, it's very easy to know. And that's why the deen is very clear. The question is that the right of every Muslim to know the answer to this question. Did the Prophet ﷺ make dhikr or worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by dancing or jumping? Uh, if someone would say, either they say yes or no, right? Definitely it's not yes, because there's no such a thing whatsoever. If a person says, maybe, but we don't know, that person has a major problem in his heart when it comes to matters of belief. Okay. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not perfect his religion. The religion has been completed and perfected. Anything that gets us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's there in the religion. Anything that gets us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's there in the religion. Prophet Sallallahu he did not return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfected the message. So if it was good, the Prophet Sallallahu would have done it. Okay. And since he didn't do it, alayhi salatu wasalam, and this is an act of worship, therefore it's evil because this is ibadah. Okay. And that's why these types of things are far worse than committing sins, than drinking wine and so on. Even though people are just doing a form of dhikr, but they're inventing the ibadah, making a religion. It's a religion different than the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And that's why we have to be very uh, stern when it comes to these things and our words that we use. Because this is a, a clear deviation away from the way of the Prophet Sallallahu And we have to be kind and soft when it comes to inviting people. You know, that, you know why it is so difficult for people to leave innovations in the deen? Because they think it's religion. Okay. So if you go to them and you tell them what you're doing, dancing to make dhikr or jumping, this is haram, this is forbidden, this is innovation. They would look at you. You're calling the religion is forbidden. That's the danger of the bid'ah. They okay. make it as a religion. And that's why we have to have the patience to take people away from this and to warn ourselves from doing anything in matters of worship that the Prophet ﷺ didn't do. Can we pray dhuhr five raka'ah? We can't do that. We we'll all agree that that means it invalidates the salah. That why? It wouldn't make you more pious. It would take right. you the opposite way. Right. Although you would read more Quran, you would make more dua. Right? So you might feel that you're closer to Allah because right. you worshipped more. This is, doesn't go with your own intellect like this. This is revelation from Allah. Okay. So if this example is very clear, we should remember it so that we can make the analogy in anything else. Okay. If we cannot make a fifth rak'ah for salah, therefore we cannot make our own way of making dhikr or worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a different way other than the way the Prophet And Shaykh, finally, just in the last 30 seconds, uh, before we give our viewers the question of the week, uh, I want to make mention of a hadith Aisha, which talks about the very issue of uh, innovations, and I'll just a brief commentary on that, where the Prophet he said, Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa rad. That the person who invents something new in our affairs, it's rejected. Is it fair to use the word rejected? Yes, because the Prophet ﷺ said, فَهُوَ رَدِّ means rejected, it's not accepted. And not just that, that the person might be even punished as a result of this. SubhanAllah. So this religion is a very strong, uh, strong uh, religion. You know, it's not something by wishful thinking. We have to learn. It's based on knowledge, which is the way the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, so to learn this and to act according to it, and with the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart, all kinds of beautiful things and happiness and contentment and purification becomes in the heart when the path is one. Ibn al-Qayyim, he summarized it in, in just one sentence, beautiful one. He said, uh, kun wahidan fi wahidin. To one, be one in one. This is the path of truth and iman. Okay. To one, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be one, don't be many different 
just be one be focused you're seeking pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone fi wahid in one path which is the way of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not uh, too many different other ways okay excellent sheikh uh, we are coming towards the end of the program and uh, we must give the viewers the question of the week uh, would you like to do the honors and give it as usual you do it <laughs> Okay, so dear viewers, let's present the question of the week. And the question this week, if you were listening very carefully, it was mentioned inside of the program. So you'll have to rewind and watch the repeat and you'll be able to pick up the answer. The question is, um, in which surah or mention a surah, uh, a, a verse from the Quran, which mentions both the Tawheed of Allah as well as Shirk? So in one verse, you will find Allah make mentioning of Tawheed and at the same time making mention of Shirk. We will put up a post on our Facebook page and then you can give us your answers uh, on the page and we'll read them out loud. Um, you have one minute if somebody picks up the phone and, and decides to answer it via phone, you'll be very lucky to do so. But otherwise, you can turn to uh, Facebook, Gems of the Heart, and give us your, your answers there and we will read them out in the following episode. Also, dear viewers, as you are aware, uh, Gems of the Heart also runs a course for those who are more serious about learning uh, their belief system and how these things affect the heart. If you go to Gems of the Heart, you will see a page there uh, where you can sign up and you can also uh, take a look at, at the questions. Uh, so please do join us on that and inshallah ta'ala you'll be able to benefit. The Huda team will look at your answers and correct them uh, accordingly. Once again, let's read out the question. You will see it there across your screens. Uh, mention a verse which mentions both the Tawheed of Allah as well as the issue of Shirk. So please do your research. You'll find it in our program. So do your research and do, uh, do that. So I'd like to thank all of you very much for coming, uh, for attending this particular course, attending this particular uh, lecture. And Sheikh, is there anything that you would like to make mention of us that, inshallah, we said it's a practical program. We don't want people to just listen and then, you know, take a break and act as if it was just a seminar but a practice what can people do walking away from this lecture so the tawheed is better uh, learn how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the proper belief take it upon yourself that you would learn your belief in the way of the Prophet والسلام, so that you, our actions our speech are sound and clear and good do not ignore matters of belief. Do not think that you know it by default. Okay. No, we have to have the patience to learn it. Okay, thank you very much, Sheikh. And I'd also like to thank you for uh, taking your time and coming to the program. It's my pleasure. And I uh, conclude by saying, Assalamu alaikum. Dear viewers, we have come to the end of our program here on Gems of the Heart. And before I say goodbye, I'd also like to make a special thanks to Sister Aisha uh, Nuruddin, who makes a comment on our Facebook page. And she says, I'm watching your program. And I'd like to thank all of you for uh, continuing the program. So thank you very much for that comment. Dear viewers, I thank all of you for tuning in and we will see you next week at the same time at the same place with me and the Sheikh. So until then, Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.